although the degree to which this constituted forward planning was very limited. Urban development proceeded without any attempt to comprehend the city as a dynamic economic and social form. Brisbane emerged largely as an unplanned city, spilling geographically beyond council boundaries in haphazard fashion. Sporadic commercial and residential development occurred in response to investment booms and market conditions. Roads and other transport systems were devised in piecemeal fashion, often with little thought to the impact of discrete decisions. In Australia, coordination of policy provision has been almost non-existent. Vertical coordination, that is between federal, state and local governments, has typically been ad hoc and compartmentalised in relation to specific departmental programs, often initiated only when major problems flared. Horizontal coordination, that is local regional, remains virtually untried in Australia, although representatives from local authorities regularly gather for various consultative exchanges. So the uh, next part of uh, my paper uh, addresses the question of what political policy changes are taking place which may redress this problem of lack of coordination between levels of government, lack of planning, lack of policy for the management of cities. Strategies to improve urban management have recently reappeared on political and administrative agendas in Australia. Australian governments are now giving greater attention to the issues associated with the quality of urban life as part of a more general commitment to microeconomic reform and its corollaries of improved public sector management and strategic policy management. Corporate management philosophies and administrative reforms have encouraged governments to integrate internal government processes and emphasise intergovernmental coordination. While not addressed particularly to city management, these procedural changes provide a change in context within which cities can be comprehended. As part of these new philosophies, there is a trend to establish justifiable processes of planning which can be effective and are less specific to particular ideas or strategies. And a very good example of this is the South East Queensland 2001 project. Uh, South East Queensland is the growth corridor of Queensland and includes <coughs> Brisbane as the capital city. Uh, South East Queensland has something like double the rate of growth that the rest of the state is experiencing and Queensland is the fastest growing state in Australia. So in a sense I suppose the South East Queensland uh, region is the... Um, is experiencing rapid growth and uh, has demanded a policy response. The South East Queensland 2001 project aims to strengthen processes of planning for the region by systematically integrating existing institutions and organisations rather than resorting to new bu bureaucracies or strategy plans. And this is quite an interesting reaction to the first um, attempt to plan for the region, uh, both the Brisbane City Council, well I should say the Brisbane City Council, but at sort of uh, more specific policy levels, the state government initially produced a range of strategy plans, but for various political reasons um, these generally came unstuck. Changing governments, um, the, the colour of governments was one reason that strategy plans sort of um, were brought into question. So this is why I think the process uh, emphasis is now being developed. Um, there's also um, a historical political explanation for why um, there's a, um, a reluctance to introduce a planning department as such in Queensland. Um, most other states actually do have planning departments. Queensland is a bit of an anomaly here. But uh, the strength of its local government sector and the general, perhaps not so much the strength of its local government sector, uh, but the general absence of planning by the state government uh, historically has meant 
that the local government sector is very reluctant to have a, a sort of new institutional structure imposed on them. So the government is resorting through this sort of corporate government philosophy to developing processes of integrated planning between levels of government, as I suggested, and uh, also interdepartmentally within governments. And better cities, as we heard yesterday um, from, from Blair, uh, is, I think, uh, an example of the federal government's um, attempts to introduce some coordination between levels of government in planning. Um, he's perhaps a little more cynical of that process than I am, but then I wasn't uh, doing this sort of analysis in 1970, um, which might explain why. Uh, when it was, in fact, uh, tried, of course, as we heard yesterday, and failed, generally. Um, yes, I'm sort of... Now, another interesting part of this uh, new approach to planning in, in Queensland uh, is the, uh, and this particular model of corporate government, is the incorporation of community consultation. And I would be interested to hear, actually, whether there are examples of this in this country, um, in the government's sort of corporatisation of uh, its various policy activities. Um, because the corporate government model in Queensland has uh, stressed the importance of community consultation to sort of justify its client focus, which is part of this new corporate model, uh, that the client is, is what, it, what government's all about and uh, the only way you can really deliver effective outcomes for clients is to consult with them. And so the community has been incorporated into these new planning processes in Queensland and, and South East Queensland 2001 project is an example of this sort of incorporation of the community um, in an advisory planning body. There are again some uh, problems with that, that sort of incorporation of, of the community. Um, but I don't think I'll go into that right now. Um, if anybody wants to ask me about it later, that's uh, possible. But I think of interest uh, to community and social movements, um, the degree to which local groups can capture the growth machine institutions within Australian cities and thus reshape policy agendas is, is something that's um, you know, going to be watched with interest in this new sort of corporate government uh, approach to planning policy. So finally then I think I'll just say that um, in Australia improved urban management can be further enhanced in the future by establishing a framework designed to empower service uh, providing agencies at the city level, specifically local government. This empowerment has a number of features, including the legal provisions for greater autonomy. I mean, one of the problems with Brisbane City Council is that even though it had these generally wide powers of a sort of general competence power, uh, in its enabling legislation. This has subsequently been overridden to a large extent by other pieces of state legislation uh, which has limited the extent to which it can actually use this um, general competence power. So strengthening, I think, uh, local authority legislation by giving it greater autonomy. Uh, fiscal relations. This is an area that requires some improvement in Australia. Um, federal fiscal transfers have in Australia traditionally been from the federal government to the states and then the states were free to sort of distribute what they saw fit to local authorities. Uh, if um, fiscal transfers could be strengthened and um, direct fiscal transfers in particular, again that would uh, give local authorities more flexibility in terms of developing policies for cities. The scope of revenue raising, I think, too, is an important one. Um, 
in Australia, as I said, local authorities are dependent on uh, property rates for their revenue. There is no tax, so um, being able to uh, introduce new forms of tax that aren't quite so um, obvious. Uh, I mean, I think this is one of the problems that the property tax is, is, uh, is, is so, um, so obvious that uh, it's difficult to redistribute um, or introduce redistributive policies, which is why there has been this emphasis on uh, distribution rather than redistribution in, in cities in Australia. But other forms of tax might broaden the scope for redistribution within the city. Um, okay, well, I think I might just leave it there then. Thank you. What, what we'll do, since uh, Peter Sparrett and, and uh, Hugo Hinsley are doing a double act, uh, is to take questions for Janet now, uh, 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 right away. Uh, so if there's any comment or question, uh, can, we, can we start on Janet's paper right away? Yes. Yeah. I was asking about the uh, corporatist approach in city urban regeneration context. So, I mean, the example that comes to mind in the UK is the City Action Team initiative, which was an attempt to bring together regional offices of uh, municipalities, TTI, DOE, home offices, I guess, and home offices, and tourist board and so on, uh, sort of public private partnership basis, on, and uh, focused on very, very small areas, really city centre, city centre management, or in some cases, those city fringes that I was talking about yesterday. And um, I think that they did achieve um, a small amount of uh, participation of representatives in the locality, particularly if they were industrial districts or city centre districts. But I don't think they were concerned to uh, involve um, people as, uh, as representatives of a residential area. So, oh, yeah. so there, is, there is that, and um, I think that continues. Um, I'm not sure that you could call um, <coughs> urban development corporations, uh, you know, another example of that, because I mean, there's a big, there's a rich literature of that. But uh, you know, they are they are apply corporatist kind of solutions from the top down, imposed largely against the interests of the, the local authorities, and uh, you know, had to put up with them and so on. Um, so it's not a partnership in that sense. The action teams are attracted. And city challenges has already been mentioned. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's very segmented in the sense that it's just top slices. An uh, urban program is funded that way. Uh, but it is located upon um, often largely uh, residential uh, areas suffering decline. There are, are a range, but it's quite a, a, you know, a hodgepodge in the UK, I think. Mm. Well, thank you for that information, yes. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about the corporate, corporatist approach in, in Queensland in particular uh, is um, that I, I have actually argued elsewhere that it is um, um, an attempt to control local authorities and uh, uh, by stealth, actually, because, I mean, that the, there are claims of decentralisation and yet it seems very much that... I mean, one of the things about this corporate model is that um, it does offer the potential for cent more centralised control, as you've obviously experienced here. Um, and, and, and the state government is, I think, pursuing this because, as I suggested, developing new forms of um, bureaucracy or um, new f levels of government, like regional government, is politically untenable. And, uh, and strongly resisted. And so they're actually, I think, using the corporate government model to sort of centralise control so that they can plan regionally in the way that local authorities are incapable of doing. But at the same time, that incorporation of the community, and I mean here the resident community, I mean, they're quite an interesting... There's the environmental community, there's sort of the, the social service community. Um, there are a range of... Sort of community interests that have been incorporated into this, 
So there's this kind of both ends of the spectrum, if you like, this sort of centralised corporatist model, which has included this community input. Um, and it seems there's, there's going to be some... Well, there is a tension there, actually, because a lot of people aren't very happy with the process because it's very slow. I mean, because you've got, you know, um, conflicting interests. And, um, and so uh, outcomes are, are not... Um, you know, not readily apparent, and uh, people are getting quite frustrated with the process. But um, anyway, it remains to be seen how effective it will be. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, Janice, what strikes me about part of the u uniqueness of um, Brisbane, and while I'm um, intrinsically regional government, one could, one could argue is, is superior to the sort of organization you get in the United States. But it seems the difference between the unitary system and the federal system with respect to redistribution is that um, in Australian uh, governments at the local government level, there's really um, not the same responsibility <coughs> that you get in, say, the unitary system for education, for health, for housing, and so on. Which, which is delivered at the state level. So I suppose with the, the more typical situation of very small local governments in metropolitan areas, that's why, in fact, they were assumed um, almost that sole responsibility for the sort of distribution via the property market and tried to, I suppose, through land use and so on, focus their activity there over and above their housekeeping chores. But, um, it, what I'm saying is that the opportunities for redistribution because of it, you know, it's the position of the city council within um, a federalist system are quite different to the, the, the scope of responsibilities that you have, say, in a, in a unitary system. Um, or even given our present system, there's very real limits to what it, what it can do by way of redistribution. I mean, it's libraries, it's swimming pools, it's clinics. <coughs> yes, yeah, so that 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 that's only sort of 8% of the budget anyway. Yeah, I mm. realise that, because mm. that's why you're saying that a lot of it goes basically into the property mm. um, sector. Mm. Sorry, I'm not sure whether you really had a question, did you? Or? Uh, I've got a comment about <laughs> the uniqueness of the group and the regional system of regional city or regional metropolitan government within the federalist system in Australia is always going to be limited in terms of what it can do vis-a-vis -vis redistribution. Because those powers and most of the main sectors lie with the state. Yes, but of course the state, I mean the point of the argument here is that the state is concerned for a regional territory beyond the city. I mean, it's, you know, so in many ways the city is kind of neglected as, as a site. Of, of policy, um, and I mean the rural bias, bias in Australia is, you know, a classic example of that, of the problem with the sort of federal system of government and that kind of territorial-wide um, jurisdiction that, that states have. So cities tend to be overlooked in many ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yes, I, I don't even want to pursue the same question in a different way. Brisbane, of course emerged as, as unique in the way it did because of a particular set of historical circumstances. And one of them was, of course, that um, Brisbane was relatively small in relationship to the rest of the state, at least at the time when that decision was made. And therefore, didn't a, Brisbane, a Greater Brisbane Council didn't pose any kind of political threat to a state government. Mm -hmm. um, and by and large, of course, the governments that were the stewards of, of that at the state state level and even more recently until quite recent time at the Brisbane, uh, Greater Brisbane level were philosophically not likely to want to disrupt that all that much. But now I think a set of new circumstances have arisen where first of all Labor's been in control both at the at the state level and the city level. Uh, it, it's, it, Brisbane as you've explained is experiencing more dynamic growth than any other part of the country. And it's therefore possible to have imagined that it might have taken a different path. What, what, what you're describing sounds to me rather as though, rather than of realising what might have been the potential of a different path in which it might have continued to annex areas on its circumference, where it might have taken a larger planning role, uh, where citizenship might have been a means of political expression through the greater Brisbane area, uh, 
It's act, in fact assimilating itself much more predominant Australian pattern by corporate, by huge start, by a corporate mm. model. And um, I suppose the question that emerges out of that is, it, are those issues focused in a way that enables them to be debated, or is this occurring somehow without debate or without any recognition that there was an alternative? Well, you see, where the Brisbane City Council is concerned, I mean, actually, most of the growth in South East Queensland is occurring outside the city limits. Yes, but I, I mean, the, in the shires, Logan and Pine and... Yeah, but exactly. But, but if you follow the, the pattern that Americans followed, at least until the 1930s, <coughs> the alternative would have been annexation by, by the city of Brisbane of the area's own circumference. So it could have continued to grow and continued to, to express itself as a a Greater Brisbane Council that corresponded with what is now becoming the de facto urban area, which of course now really spreads down to the Gold Coast and beyond. Yes. Now, you, mm. you, you said in the course of mm. your um, discussion that none of that was politically tenable. What, the annexation of? Well, I think no, you, you I wasn't. Implied, well, I think you were mm. talking in terms of that, uh, with an enlarged role for the city government, functionally at any rate, and I suppose by implication of a large territorial, territorial role, it's not politically. Yeah, I was really saying what was politically untenable was um, was the uh, was was planning imposed by the state government oh, on see. the local oh, authorities. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, what about what about? Um, I mean, well, I'd be interested to know why that's politically untenable too. Um, well, m my feeling is here that it's really. Um, <coughs> Not so much that local authorities are really are, are strong, but that the state has never actually acted in a policy role in planning. There's, there has been just a, a vacuum, and so the local authorities, you know, historically have developed a resistance to any attempt to impose any sort of planning because they alone have been responsible for planning. But that has been land use planning. It's not been anything broader than that. I think we'll take one more question and then move on to the next paper, Colin. Just a quick comment actually, Jim, one, one of the, the big problems of Brisbane City Council and the reason for a large portion of this budget going into infrastructure and transport is this is the only uh, metropolitan authority in, in Australia that sort of runs its, its own transport system, it's a bike, but, um, its own transport system and, and clearly there would be implications uh, positive implications for city management and financing budgeting if, uh, if that were part of a regional transport system rather than a city city specific transport system. That's, um, that would, I know that South East Queensland 2001 is considering those possibilities, but that would certainly, I would thought, take a substantial um, element of its uh, budgetary responsibilities in the infrastructure transport area uh, away from it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, well thanks very much for that very detailed case study, Dennis, and uh, raising again the thorny issue of policy and political economy, which I'm sure we'll come back to uh, later today. Um, we'll move now to Peter Sperrett. Uh, Peter is the, uh, the, the director of the National Centre for Australian Studies, so has had a particular links with, with this centre in London. Um, the National Centre is at Monash University in Melbourne, um, and, and Peter is also a, an urban historian, uh, and so I've been very pleased to try and draw him into this conference and to draw the National Centre into this conference. Uh, he and Hugo are, are giving us two more case studies that uh, fits quite well together. So what we'll do for the for the last two papers in this session is to have Peter's paper, then Hugo's paper, and then we'll have discussion across both both papers uh, at the end of the session. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Jim. I have a particular interest in the scale of uh, urban redevelopment, which I think has been a, a topic much debated yesterday from the grand metropolitan planning schemes of the 1940s to the site-specific schemes favoured by most developers now. In recent years, as a number of speakers yesterday argued, these developments have often failed in the very marketplace that their proponents said they would be judged by. Some of the entrepreneurs, of course, have got their just desserts. I can report that Alan Bond no longer has his name on any buildings in Hong Kong, 
although uh, he does still have his name on a university now totally owned by a Japanese company on the Gold Coast. I'm pleased to see that Lord McAlpine's banner can still be seen on the Battersea Park power station, although that's another development that I understand uh, has, has gone astray. I, re I suppose there won't be very many people here chronologically gifted <coughs> enough to recall the Battersea Park power station on a Pink Floyd uh, album cover some decades ago. <laughs> Was it Animals or Pink Floyd? Oh, oh, so I'm with you. Oh, that's, I'm being far too chronologically gifted. <laughs> the album was called Animals. I thought the gentleman to my left was suggesting it was another band going back deep into the past. In the 1980s, a mixture of the worldwide CBD property boom and the erosion of infrastructure spending saw most building in private hands and most of it very site-specific. In Australian city centres in the last... Uh, decade or so, we've seen an extraordinary amount of redevelopment which has largely revolved around office towers, five-star hotels, an unbelievable rash of five-star hotels in most of the city centres, and occasionally we've put in a shopping precinct to add to cash flow and a dash of culture. The largest site developments have, have, have continued to be, in, in just land use terms, the car-based shopping malls and they've normally been successful, although often at the expense of existing shopping facilities. But again, they presuppose, they presuppose private cars, but rely on the state to uh, provide the, the road system to service them. The multifunction polis represents a return to a grander planning notion, harking back to the Edwardian and post-war schemes that um, Graham was talking about yesterday morning. It was quickly embraced by town planners in Australia are hungry for holistic visions and, as I'll argue in a little while, also hungry for consultancy income. There have been a number of precursors to the notion of the multifunction polis, obvious precursors like garden cities, industry-specific towns that um, have grown up around steelworks or um, power stations, I think are another example. To some extent, the uh, the planned suburbs of the 1950s, which often made provision for industry and educational structures, even if, even if they didn't actually build them. We have, of course, in Australia, one uh, extraordinary urban settlement called Canberra, which has sometimes been described as a unifunction polis. 52% of its population uh, more or less work for the federal government. And, of course, you've got the megastructures rarely built that uh, Rainer Badham has uh, written about. And I guess other examples like uh, the Barbican, where one does need that uh, yellow line to get around, but still it has many functions. And in the US, the Rockefeller <coughs> Centre with its humane skating rink. But the multifunction policy debate really represents a new phase in utopian thinking about cities because the concept does not come from a concern about equity, citizenship or even civic elegance, but out of an attempt to keep up with technological change. And I guess in that sense it really is in a rather long line of, um, of utopian fantasies, again of the sort that, um, that Graham was outlining yesterday. What's happened is that the helicopter or the notion that we'd all be flying around within cities has been, has been replaced by the telecommunications revolution, optical, optical fibres and uh, their alleged potentiality. The concept came from the Japanese uh, Minister for International Trade who introduced the idea of the Australian Government in January 1987. And as uh, people here who visited uh, Japan, unfortunately I haven't, will know that it's in a long line of futuristic um, utopian Japanese plans for the urban environment with the names like Green City, Intelligent City, uh, Teletopia and so on. So uh, MITI, the, uh, the Japanese department, produced its, uh, its first sort of proposal that argued that cities need to be rebuilt and that the aim of the project was for Australia and Japan located at the northern and southernmost edges of the Pacific Rim to cooperate in building the city of the future. Mitty argued that growth had removed human qualities from the environment, although no evidence was given for this, 
It complained that large cities were, quote, mere aggregates of separate functions and that what it wanted was an organic whole. <coughs> the implication of this sort of writing, of course, is that none of the current world cities can be considered as organic wholes. And uh, having just spent a few days in Hong Kong on, on the way here, I can report that there are about 50 organic wholes in Hong Kong at the moment, all sprouting high-rise residential structures. Coming from Australia in recession, it's pretty peculiar to see a city in which you know, buildings are actually being built. To create the MFP, the, uh, this document argued that the organic whole required a leap into the fifth sphere. The attainment of a 21st century lifestyle requires a city which is not residential or industrial in function or convention and resort oriented, must have all elements of these fourth spheres and at the same time um, go to the creation of a fifth sphere. The claims of the MFP were quite extraordinary. It was going to rebuild and restore the human element to the city's residents. It was going to be a fusion of high-tech industries destined to comprise core industries in the 21st century and high-touch oriented industries which support creative human people accompanied by their families. Now, I think somebody mentioned yesterday that uh, Paris now has um, a very large proportion of single-person households, so obviously the MFP can't be built in Paris. <laughs> so it's a family-centred, you know, user-friendly concept. In terms of overall orientation of the MFP, Mithy mentioned software industries, the need for a spaceport. They are supposed to be building one in northern Queensland, as one of those sort of jokes of the late 20th century. High-touch industries like convention services. <coughs> See, this is a high-touch industry here today, I guess, when we have um, coffee in a while. Medical research and resort <laughs> industries. But the thing was extraordinarily short on detail. It had almost nothing to say about ha housing, transport or the job market. Hence, academics, none of them are, none of them are present here. We, we still have quite strong libel laws. <laughs> <laughs> the ones I'm talking about, I mean. Academics throughout the nation abandoned a teaching and embraced the new consultancy prospects with rarely seen gusto. <laughs> Federal, state and city governments indulged in an orgy of commissioning. Graphic designers, just like in Docklands, had a heyday. Every time you produced one of these damn documents, you had to have, you know, lovely little uh, pictures, as I'll show you in a while, to, to go with them. They did very, very well, the graphic designers. I know a few people whose practices kicked off with this stuff. Because some of the issues were fairly technical, it was often said that if you weren't engaged in one of the consultancy projects, you weren't eligible to comment, let alone to criticise. Most of the attacks on the MFP came from very specific sections of the left, but on the whole, the architecture and town planning professions in Australia were disgracefully silent. We don't, we don't have a, a, any beacons, and any equivalents of the AA, really. <laughs> as were the business schools who were too busy submitting their consultancy invoices to bother to point out that the economic viability of the whole concept was absurd unless it was substantially underwritten by the state. The MFP became controversial in the, in the public press only when it was suggested that the new city might be an enclave for Japanese citizens. This raised concerns about sovereignty, equity and access to the new city and especially about who might get the jobs it would provide. Then we had a rather unseemly competition between the states as to who could put up the best, uh, the best concept and the best land. Sydney, of course, acclaimed that as Australia's largest, oldest and most ethnically diverse city, that it was the only viable location for the MFP. And it offered um, a large slab of toxic land in Homebush Bay <laughs> near, near some gasometers. I'm very fond of gasometers. I've been enjoying the fact you haven't demolished yours. The Melbourne submission also offered a site, uh, largely in government control, but again, there was just a little question of contamination. Canberra had none of the, these problems. As you know, it's a completely uncontaminated town. <laughs> it claimed already to be an MFP, an information and services based city with more PhDs per hundred per thousand population than anywhere else in the world. Now, <laughs> if, if, you, if you like to attack economic rationalists, you could, I think, go a long way. 
on seeing what happens to a city when it's got a higher proportion of PhDs per thousand population than anywhere else in the world. It offered uh, 460 acres in the Jerobombra Valley and it also offered to create a 90 hectare water control pond. That's Canberra jargon for a lake. <laughs> What is remarkably pleasing about all these submissions is the willingness of the Australian state to clean up or at least alter any environment to suit the proposed influx of private and corporate capital. Canberra made a lot of its recreation attractions, particularly the War Memorial, which ironically is of great interest to Japanese tourists. I also mentioned the Prime Minister's Cricket 11. I couldn't quite, couldn't quite see what that was going to do for the MFP. Queensland rejected a, que a greenfield site, saying it would be too isolated, and opted for a site in the Brisbane Gold Coast corridor. And uh, you got a fair bit of cynical comment then around Australia in the press with um, journalists saying things like, this will suit Japanese golfers down to a T. But when it became apparent that the Queensland government would have to uh, buy the site, that uh, fell through and we went to Adelaide which proposed a series of high-tech villages where, inter with, um, where interaction will provide for variation and competition within an overall environment of cooperation, sharing, trading and working together. So all the literature is just full of this kind of stuff and th that what that actually means is lakes and marinas, a mangrove forest, an open field and they're also going to create an urban forest which would connect the MFP to the ancient landscape. There's no mention in this, of course, of what the MFP would do for Aboriginal Australians, but Adelaide again claimed that it would um, revive a degraded area. And uh, Blair might like to comment later on um, whether this is likely, uh, likely to work or not, but I would point out that the Adelaide Central Business District has about as much tenanted office space as uh, North Sydney municipality. So it's a very, a very small business space. Now just a very few quick slides, and to do them, I... Uh, which one? What do we steal from there? Okay. Try one, I think, Peter. There are two controls, you see. So this is when you're a graphic designer and you want to establish your practice, this is the kind of thing you do to prove that um, although you're going to put um, the MFP in the toxic waste dump, you're putting it in a vibrant city. And to prove that the MFP is all things to all people, and that here, of course, they're trying to make the point that Melbourne is more ethnically diverse than Sydney. Certainly Melbourne's ethnic restaurants are better and cheaper. I suppose that's an important part of the definition. And uh, you, you can see, you can imagine these graphic designers rolling around on the floor, wow. 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 That's where, that's part of the Melbourne Docklands uh, area. With some extraordinary um, comparisons, I think, with uh, what you have presumably be telling us about the London, uh, London Docklands, the sense of a sort of a, a fairly abandoned area, but with great views of the CBD. That's uh, what it was going to look like, but when they produced this very expensive brochure, et voila, the public was so horrified, the brochure cost thirty or forty thousand dollars that they had to withdraw it immediately. So these are illicit images you're seeing now. Uh, people were shocked by the high rise nature of the thing and so on. Um, that was what the MFP would look like in 2010. Very similar, of course, to some of the illustrations that Graham was showing yesterday, except we have a helicopter now. And it's all optical fiber. And uh, that's, a, that's a sort of a grander view. And again, um, we get what we've had heavily now in Sydney for a while, the, uh, the marina-led recovery, I guess is what <laughs> described. That's, uh, that's real in Sydney. This is a site-specific um, development in Sydney, Darling Harbour, with its disgusting monorail, um, which serves, uh, serves nobody and is just really a, a, high, a high gimmick. It has done one thing, though, this kind of settlement has returned some of the harbour to the people. But then, back to Colin and Ken's points of yesterday, you have the American-style marketplace. 
you, uh, the shopkeepers, are forced to stay open up to 24 hours, whether they want to or not, which is an interesting sort of concept. But because you've had, this is opposite the Sydney Central Business District, because you've had no redevelopment of residential or office just beyond it, in here, it's just not viable at, at, at the moment. Very similar to, to Doc Lance in many ways. These are Hugo's slides, by the way. Um, and yet, of course, you have your exhibition trade centre and your convention centre, and uh, the casino still isn't up and running, so the whole thing is a terrible, um, a terrible drain on the state government's coffers. Okay. In, uh, in conclusion, the fact that the MFP won't go ahead in its original grandiose way, I see as a good outcome, especially given its attempt to appeal to on enclave notions of gated and secure communities. It shows the government and capital acting without adequate community or even intergovernmental consultation, say with local government, couldn't get it together, which I also take as very pleasing. I think that the MFP debate is um, belatedly getting discussion going about public and private space and the rights of urban dwellers, and I see that as another positive outcome. And uh, the other thing I would say in introducing Hugo is, of course, London already has its own MFP in Docklands. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Well, the other leg of this troika uh, organising the, the conference and, and is, is of course uh, associated with the Architectural Association. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Uh, if, anyone, if anyone's got actually specific detailed questions about MFP, they want to, while they remember them, to pick up with, with Peter, we could do that. But otherwise, I'll go straight on uh, and we'll see what we come to at the end. So unless there are any particular points of technical detail. I want to, uh, in the time we've got available, try to look at two very different cases in London and to draw some conclusions from them. I start from much of what we were discussing yesterday, the, the, the concept that cities are always in transition uh, and that they are at the same time coherent and fragmented. There are many different things going on in any city at any one time, though people's perception and certainly policy makers and government's perception of what's going on uh, may be very different from what's happening on the ground. I think the periods of great shift in uh, physical <coughs> and economic circumstances are very interesting, the sort of changes of gear that happen within all economies as external and internal forces uh, create a uh, major shift, are in sometimes the, the, the most interesting times and also the times at which other things can bubble to the surface, that, that other possibilities about the future of the city have a chance uh, to get heard. And I think to some extent, with the collapse of the property boom-led explosion of the 80s, by the end of the 80s, uh, there is now space for better discussion uh, in the London context. Uh, to be optimistic, the current slump also gives more time, because one of the features of the sort of development that we see in the 80s is that it is extremely fast and extremely undemocratic, so that there is actually no time and no space and no possibility to talk about what is happening. It's happened by the time you've turned around to complain about it. So to be optimistic, a slump is a very good thing if you're not a developer. They've been dropping like nine pins, as any of you who followed the stock market and the, the way in which uh, property-led investment uh, has failed in the past uh, three years dramatically. It's an astonishing history, which I won't go into now. It's also worth noting that Britain, uh, compared with any of the other European countries, has a much larger section of its economy related to property speculation and the movement of property than any of the other European countries. So we're very much locked into that as a function of our economy. It's a very serious problem for us. One of the things that has happened in uh, the boom uh, slump cycle is that as we've moved into slump also, other voices are beginning to be heard. A debate is getting up off the ground again about what should happen to London. Many different sorts of organizations, sometimes initiated by professional bodies, by different institutions, different interest groups, sometimes much more in the form of networking. There's an organization, for example, called Vision for London, which is simply a way in which anyone who's doing anything 
about the future of London can record it uh, and everybody else can know about it. So it's a sort of newsletter type operation, very effective. Uh, we have representatives here from London 2000, now London Regeneration, uh, who've been very active in getting a different sort of debate going, not just amongst professionals, but amongst a whole range of other people, including very active, well-structured, well-organized community organizations. And I'll say a bit more about community later on. It's a very difficult concept and one which is pushed around a lot by many different people to mean very different things. London, like any big city, exhibits a, a wide range of different examples uh, at any one time, and I'm going to take two examples, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to deal with them very briefly. Uh, those of you that know London uh, will be able to tune in perhaps a little better than, than those that don't, but I have tried uh, through the slides to give those of you that don't know uh, London at least some chance to see what I'm talking about. The first case I'll look at is, is Docklands. Uh, because one could not, not look at Docklands. Uh, it is an extraordinary case. It's one of the major cases in the world of a market-led <coughs> Big Bang type of development, uh, a very large scale with very large blocks of monofunctional activity. So quite the opposite of the idea of the multifunctional policy. It's actually extremely separated out, big blocks of housing, big blocks of office development, as I'll show you. It's also central government initiated and the uh, rhetoric of it is that it should be market-led and paid for by the market. In fact, the reality is it's very largely been underwritten and uh, what's laughably called pump-primed by our money, by taxpayers' money, to the tune of uh, about eight billion pounds so far. Uh, and going up rapidly as the private sector drops out, the state picks up more and more of the cost. It's also interesting in being anti-planning, and very explicitly anti-planning. Statements made by the London Docklands Development Corporation and by the Prime Minister at the time, Thatcher, uh, and by her uh, Minister of the Environment, Heseltine, explicitly saying that planning is an impediment to the development of the market. Uh, it actually gets in the way of free market, and planning, therefore, must not be allowed to exist in this area, uh, and that would make uh, a much better end result. Uh, this was combined with extremely fast track techniques of construction. Those of you who are familiar with America or Hong Kong uh, will know how fast uh, we can build nowadays if we want to. And a combination of all those things leading to a very explicit exclusion of community, however you might wish to define community. The impossibility for anybody living, and the 40,000 people living in the area, it's not a tabula rasa, it's a large population that have been there for generations. Uh, the complete exclusion of any possibility of engagement in a process that has been removed from any democratic process. And I'll explain quite how that happened in a minute. Now, the second case I'll take is Spitalfields, just to the east of the city of London. Uh, those of you that don't know uh, the way we use language here, when we talk about London, we talk about the city of London. But there's also something called the city. Uh, and the city, uh, as you know, is the center of international finance, uh, the largest conglomeration of international banks and uh, finance institutions uh, in Europe and desperately competing to be and to remain to be the world city in the third time zone, uh, competing with uh, other European countries, particularly increasingly with the, th the threat of Berlin taking over from Frankfurt, uh, to be the European time zone with Tokyo and New York uh, to make up the, the system that controls supposedly the flow of international finance capital. Now, Spitalfields, uh, <coughs> in the shadow of this great uh, offshore operation, which is the city. It has its own government, which is not elected, its own police force, its own system of deciding about things. It's got nothing to do with London. Uh, just around it, of course, there are areas that are affected very dramatically by the shockwave of what happens within the city. One of those is Spitalfields, a very interesting area with a great history I'll very briefly refer to in the slides. Here, a history of non-planning and failure of planning by local government led to two different things happening uh, towards the end of the boom in the 80s. Firstly, private capital starting to make piecemeal proposals, picking off some of the larger sites within the Spitalfields area as an expansionist program to take the city outside the city and build large-scale office <coughs> developments. Uh, secondly, community in the sense, in this case, of a very large 
representation of about a hundred different organizations eventually forming themselves into uh, a legal organization, the Spitalfields Community Development Group, uh, and now forming themselves into a community development trust, which I'll explain a bit later, uh, entering into the planning process. Not uh, saying, uh, please, could we say something about this, but actually saying we are part of what the planning process is and taking a, a fairly uh, uh, well-structured and well-organized political position about how they had a voice within uh, what was, at the time, while the boom was still going on, seen as a major battle between the forces uh, of the city expansion and the existing population of central London. As the boom collapsed, private capital has backed off uh, and, and to some extent disappeared, though land holdings are still within uh, those large chunks of private capital. Uh, and uh, a community plan uh, has been published. Uh, I've got a copy of it here, which people can look at perhaps at the coffee break, uh, which has been adopted by the local authority. Interestingly, in, in, this is in an area of London where local planning uh, still exists through an elected local government. Uh, and therefore has some credibility in the legal process of plan making within the area. And interestingly, is partially accepted uh, as a way forward by the existing uh, capitals who are still involved in land ownership within the area who haven't gone bankrupt. So there is some uh, sense that there is a new discussion here that's possible. Now, the interesting thing about the plan, uh, apart from its origins and who made the plan and how it was made, is that it's a long-term strategic plan, not at all like the sort of doctrines development plan, which said there shall be no plan. Uh, that long-term plan explicitly interrelates economic, social, and physical planning. It says you can't have one without the other. You've got to have all of that fitted together as a proper framework, and it does it very coherently. And it also, and this is particularly interesting, says that uh, real assets have to flow back into the planning process and be redistrib redistributed to the Community Development Trust so that the old game of what is called planning gain in this country, where as part of the crumbs off the table of a deal between the developers and the planning authority, there is some sort of so-called benefit to the community, a, a little swimming pool, a library or something, which is the planning gain, uh, which often is quite inappropriate to the needs of local people uh, and, and certainly is not an asset that is useful in further development of their economy or their area, the stakes here are much higher. The planning gain, if you like, is to be land, and that land to be controlled by a development trust made up of the local government, of representatives of the large private capitals in the area, and of elected representatives of community organizations in the area. So it's quite an interesting different uh, form of negotiation that's going on, by no means resolved yet. Now, before uh, showing you slides of these two areas, I just want to raise a couple of general points. Uh, I won't go into much detail because we haven't got time and we have to some extent covered them uh, yesterday. One point, uh, I think, is that cycles of change in cities are the results both of opportunities for change and of forces for change. And the conjunction of those two coming together at different times in history produces very different results. In post-war Western European cities, opportunities for change have included such factors as the massive uh, restructuring of transport systems uh, and the resulting land uses uh, that were tied down by rail yards and other uh, docklands and other areas. And secondly, the shift of economies from uh, industrial base to service-based economies. So the demand for large land uses in the old 19th century city, uh, evaporating Battersea Power Station or whatever else it might be, actually coming up for grabs as a major inner city site so the opportunities there are very great. Now, the forces are often combined both uh, in an often unholy alliance, political forces and economic forces, and I won't try and disentangle it too much uh, now. The 1980s, uh, for example, was typified by a very powerful perception in developers in London that what was needed was a high-tech, uh, big floor plate dealing room uh, the imagery of this big dealing room, very important to them, and that created a certain sort of building. You had to have very large floor plates, and it had to look like it was a sort of high technology machine. In fact, they're often built in extremely Luddite ways uh, by uh, people up to their knees in wet concrete, but, but they look like they sort of come out of some microchip world. Now, that was linked diabolically with Thatcher's particular vision 
of the future of Britain and of, of, of London as a political necessity. This free market model, uh, particularly the Big Bang deregulation of all the finance mechanisms that I'm sure you know about, the deregulation of the stock exchange in 86, and her putting in place such organizations as urban development corporations and then enterprise zones, as things that actually swept away uh, the so-called impediments. So these, these two factors came together very forcefully, that we should have these new, glossy, literary, very big things, and the government was saying, we've got to stand up and be the world city that will compete uh, uh, for that place with Tokyo and New York. The extraordinary thing that happened then in London uh, by the mid-'80s, because of the failure of any strategic planning, and as you'll know, uh, after a great battle, the Greater London Council was abolished in 1986. And since then, London is the only large city in Western Europe that has no overall strategic planning authority. One of the results of that was that as this hysteria took off, that we've got to do these great buildings and it's tremendously competitive, we've got to be up there and fighting and looking better than anywhere else, was you've got internal competition between the city of London, this little island in the middle of London, and Dockland which was being promoted heavily by the government uh, and to which, to some extent, Thatcher and Heseltine had pinned their reputations as being the future of London's uh, business centre. The city was jolly annoyed about this and they therefore removed all their planning constraints uh, and let a free wheel go in the city of London. Now, the net result of that was that we had a massive overproduction of office uh, space, much greater than has happened in any, any of the Australian cities. Uh, just to give you a feel of it, the city of London, since 1985, has rebuilt more than 50% of its floor space. Now, by that I mean more than 30 million square feet since 1985. That's in the city of London, this old historic core, actually ripped apart and reconstructed more than 50% of its office floor space. We now have office vacancies in the city of over 20%. We have office vacancies in Dockland, the competing other model, of over 60%. We have an extraordinary phenomenon now of buildings which, depending on how you look at it, uh, uh, and depending on which economic analyst you look at, might not be occupied for five years, might not be occupied 10, might not be occupied 15 years. These are buildings built on fast track, uh, push it up, wallpaper type uh, construction, the shelf life of these buildings is probably no longer than 15 years anyway. So we're beginning to get into a cycle where buildings are being built, will stand empty, and will be demolished, all within uh, that uh, so-called logical free market economic cycle. So the very peculiar things are beginning to happen. Uh, those of you here who've been engaged in the debate in London will know the bitter details of some of that. Now, just before we do move to the, the, the slides, if I could pick out three particular aspects amongst many others, that I think are worth keeping our eye on in this past 12 years phenomenon in Britain. One is the concept of growth, the idea of growth. Another is the function of scale and speed of change that is beginning to affect us. And the third is the inadequacy of the frameworks for planning decision-making that we have inherited, as it were, from previous Situation. So we're actually not any longer equipped to deal with the phenomena that are confronting us. I won't say much about any of those. On the growth front, uh, I've already talked about the imperative this world city status uh, appeared to put on us, uh, and the, uh, in political minds, idea that uh, growth can own, is the only positive objective. You've got to get bigger, you've got to get better. There's no possible concept of consolidating settling where you are, or even perhaps reducing and restructuring. Of course, growth uh, is always uh, represented by politicians as being a positive thing. The reality in Britain uh, during this period has been that it's been a very negative thing, extremely divisive. We've moved more and more into segregation of uses of the city, more and more into developing ghettos of rich and ghettos of poor, quite separated from each other. Just to give you a feel of that, in crude statistics, you know, the, in, in Britain, the annual growth in real incomes, uh, this is from 1977 to 1990, for the top 5% of the population, the annual growth in real incomes has been averaging 
for the bottom 5% in the same period, the average has been 0%. So the differential dramatically opening up within the uh, socio-economic structure of this country. The second point, the scale and speed of change. I think all I need to say about that is just to remind you of the scale of some of the very large operations proposed. If you take the proposal for Canary Wharf by Olympia and York, uh, now half built, and you add to it the proposal for King's Cross, which some people here know a great deal about, you come to a figure of 22 million square foot of new office space. Now, if you remember, the city is 60 million square foot. It gives you some idea of the scale. It's just two projects, 22 million square foot. So that's scale. If you think about speed, uh, and there's a great mythology about fast track. Fast track isn't necessarily much faster than anything else. It's a lot of hype. In fact, I was looking at the Empire State Building when I was in New York a few weeks ago and checking on the records, and that was, in fact, built much faster uh, than uh, the tower of uh, Olympia and York's Canary Wharf. So we haven't gone very far in 50 years. But the hype is that it's all about fast track. And in fact, Canary Wharf has built 4.3 million square foot in 26 months with a workforce of 4,500 people working 24 hours a day. It is an extraordinary organization of labor and power uh, to produce a particular built form. Still, uh, uh, enough of that. The third point was the inadequate uh, frameworks of planning. Uh, and and uh, there I won't go into any detail. The imposition, obviously, of quite new models, the Urban Development Corporation, the abolition of the GLC, throwing on to existing small elected local governments the responsibility for taking decisions that would have an effect throughout the whole of London, throughout the whole of the southeast of England, and indeed in terms of the Channel Tunnel, Camden Council that we're in now, having to make decisions about King's Cross, which will affect the whole linkage of transport networks back into the whole of Europe. And this is a small local elected council with planning responsibilities for a very small area of a bit of London. So it's too local. It's often unskilled in the scale of planning decision-making it's trying to make uh, and can't deal with the problems. It's trapped in this planning game linkage deal, which is typ typified within the British planning system. It's often tempted or threatened by developers shopping around, saying, well, if you don't give us a good deal, we'll go to the next place. Uh, and indeed now threatened through changes in our planning law, which mean that appeals systems in our planning law mean that a developer can sue a planning authority for obstructing permission if it is later overturned uh, by the Secretary of State. So if a planning permission is refused by a local government, now if you're dealing with projects that are worth billions of pounds and you obstruct them for a year, so-called obstruct them, and it is then overthrown as de facto it will be by a Conservative government Secretary of State, you're, as a small local government, then facing a bill for hundreds of millions of pounds for exercising your right to be a planning authority. So it's a very, in that way, uh, un untenable position. Uh, enough uh, uh, depression. Let me move to the two cases very quickly. Um, 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 I just put that up to remind those of you that, that are not familiar with London, this is just the, the greater London area, 32 different local governments. This little bit in the middle is the city of London, a free state, as it were. You can see here the political makeup, uh, which I won't go into now, it's very, very typical. Uh, the East End, the working class, downwind, heavy industry, poor people, vote Labour. Uh, rich suburbs, vote Liberal in your terms, if you're Australian Conservative, uh, if you're British. Uh, with a few odd wobbly mixed ones, which are quite interesting. In fact, Spitalfields is in a wobbly mixed one, uh, and I'll explain how that makes it particularly interesting. Now, the east end of London, uh, an area of, of about 100 square kilometres, uh, stretching out east of... Here is Tower Bridge, for those of you who want orientation, the Tower of London. Here is Liverpool Street Station. This area here is Spitalfields, so the boundary of the city of London runs down Bishopsgate here. Uh, then the river stretching out and moving into the great docks of the 19th century. These are the largest single enclosed docks ever built, redundant within 30 years of their construction. 
uh, one of the great tragedies of, of, of uh, the end of the Victorian period of construction, uh, a very large area stretching out eventually to the sea. <coughs> You can see that as an aerial view taken from a balloon in 1902, uh, just after the royals had really come into commission. Now you can get some idea of the extent here of the Tower of London, uh, right down at the bottom here on Tower Bridge, uh, and the river stretching away. You can see at that point, uh, full of shipping. Uh, the story, of course, is very different uh, today. The area appropriated uh, by the Thatcher government in this extraordinary move in 1981, Thatcher came to power in 1979, and one of the first objectives was this concept of urban development corporations, the flagship of which was to be the London Docklands Development Corporation. As the docks had declined, and by the 1970s, most of them had closed, the existing local governments, the five local governments with land in the Docklands area, plus the Greater London Council, had formed a consortium as a planning development consortium. Uh, and the Docklands Joint Committee, as it was known, uh, had already started work on major land reclamation, on housing programs, uh, and on the infrastructure and resources necessary to see this as a tremendous opportunity to bring back to the poor East End of London many of the resources and facilities it needed to rebalance the city, uh, to, to build in the transport infrastructures that desperately needed to bring that part of the city back into town. Thatcher came to power in 79, in 81, she said, this is no good, it's too slow, it's too democratic, it causes all these barriers and people talk too much, and there's all this consultation going on, it'll never get off the ground. We will establish uh, a single-minded development agency. This was the words that, that uh, Michael Hesseltine used in announcing the Docklands Development Corporation, which I've marked in red here. This land was appropriated from the local governments and given to a new... Uh, consortium of businessmen appointed directly by uh, Thatcher, uh, no, non-elected and with no uh, representation uh, of uh, local government or local people, uh, all of whose meetings uh, were and are in private. Uh, there is no access uh, to their mechanisms. Now this removed, of course, planning control from the local governments, one of the great assets that local government has in this country. Uh, and it appropriated land from local government the other great asset that local government has. However, it did not relieve local government of its responsibilities. So within that area, local government is still responsible for transportation, for employment, for housing, for social services, education, health, but all the resources which might have been used to give them the basis on which to continue to provide for those things are being removed. There was this attitude that it was somehow a tabula rasa, if you could take this land, that there weren't many thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, living on the land and around the land that were affected by it. Uh, and it was going to be a clean sweep. To add insult to injury, the budget to finance this development corporation was not new money. It was actually appropriated from the urban development uh, urban program funds uh, and redirected, therefore, from money that had already been earmarked for local government to use on, on, on urban development. Going on from that, the and this is looking now from Tower Bridge down into the East End. You can see here, just beginning to rise, this is about three years old, the slide, the Tower of Canary Wharf uh, on the Isle of Dogs. This gives you some idea in more detail of the space uh, appropriated. Zoned into four major zones, uh, of which this zone has scarcely yet been uh, <coughs> developed, the Royal Docks. Uh, it was coming on stream just as the boom slumped. Uh, this area has been redeveloped primarily for office functions, very monofunctional. Canary Wharf is just here. Uh, this area is primarily about housing, very monofunctional. I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, and this area is much more about heritage. Here are some old warehouses and other fine buildings, which if they were in the way, they would accidentally go on fire uh, and then be demolished and replaced by new flats. If they were, could be recommodified as luxury housing, uh, that's what's happened to them. In addition to the development corporation, uh, a new idea, the enterprise zone, was then imposed within the area of the Isle of Dogs. Canary Wharf, again, is just here, uh, uh, as a free fall area. Within that area, there's no taxation, no capital gains tax, no property tax, uh, no uh, wealth tax of any sort. Uh, there's no development land tax. There's no industrial training levies. Uh, there's no 
uh, planning control of any meaningful sort. And the idea was that the enterprise zone would allow the free market a really free hand to take uh, what was called the critical mass to really make it all happen at once and really be a successful uh, story. Uh, and so you find then developments beginning to uh, advertise themselves. This was taken about eight years ago uh, with these wonderful uh, goodies that were to attempt people from the city to uh, move out to what was perceived at the time and sadly still is perceived as being out of London. For the estate agents, it was a bonanza. They couldn't believe their luck. Suddenly, all of this stuff was going to be uh, commodified, and they were going to be the people that were wheeling and dealing and buying and selling. So very distinguished firms of estate agents, if you'd asked them six months before why they got an office in Docklands, they'd fallen over laughing, uh, suddenly sprung up like mushrooms uh, in the old warehouses uh, and were busily packaging up and selling on uh, buildings like this, very fine, uh, early 19th century buildings. <coughs> Uh, sold as uh, recommodified uh, luxury, what was then called yuppie uh, housing. Another thing happened with housing, uh, which I think is particularly disturbing, and that was the development of the enclosed ghetto of new luxury housing with security cameras, gates, uh, guards, uh, uh, privatisation of the waterfront, a privatisation of space, something that we haven't had in Britain since the... Uh, late 18th century, the idea that the rich have to protect themselves with barriers and guards uh, and that they are, to effect, in effect, ghettoized within the areas of poverty uh, within the city. Uh, so that's a disturbing further feature of, of this uh, privatization of, of space. Meanwhile, of course, the existing population also ghettoized, living in uh, accommodation like this, often very finely built originally, but desperately in need of relatively small amounts of money to bring it back into reasonable living conditions as social housing. That money withdrawn from local governments, so no expenditure on the upkeep uh, maintenance of public housing, while masses of, of public money have been spent uh, on the subsidy to private housing as we discussed yesterday. So the fragmentation of that created, uh, socially, uh, environmentally, physically, and politically, are very great. On the Surrey Docks site, which was monofunctional as housing primarily, uh, developers asked to compete for different sites and dusting off their standard plan types, A, B, and C, that they use in all the suburban redevelopment. And what we get is uh, suburban development within a few uh, miles of the centre of the capital city. So it's extraordinary that this sort of housing is being built in central London. Uh, it, it reflects something very peculiar about the market and about what happens if you remove any sort of planning thing. The only thing it tells you, this isn't Milton Keynes, is the view from your backyard. <laughs> so they haven't quite got an obelisk that size in Milton Keynes yet, but they're trying. Now, we talked about yesterday the collapse of this. I won't go into this. Of course, much of this housing uh, uh, has never been occupied. Uh, a lot of it uh, has been uh, then occupied and repossessed by finance organizations. 16,000 new so-called luxury private houses have been built. 4,000 of those 16,000 are empty. The process of, of mortgage defaults and so on, we talked about yesterday. I won't go into uh, the dramatic effect of that on this attempt to revitalize uh, has been, of course, particularly devastating. Uh, people vote with their feet uh, when they can. In many cases, now, the best thing to do is simply to, to walk away and throw the keys into the dock. That there's actually no point in sustaining a mortgage on a property where the um, loss of value of the property is so great that you're paying out for the next 40 years on something that will never regain the extraordinary uh, hysterical boom price that you paid for it. I mean, while the existing population lives increasingly uh, in the shadow of this type of uh, new development, briefly just to look at the commercial development, uh, this sort of uh, Manhattanization of, of the landscape, uh, very fast, uh, very large, mostly empty, as I said, 60% vacant office space uh, in Docklands. Uh, some of it extraordinarily ugly. Uh, I mean, if, if architects are given this sort of chance, they don't seem to be able to do anything good with the opportunity, which is uh, it's sad, really. I mean, the, the opportunity to actually do all this building should have provoked a slightly better architectural reaction. Um, 
Some of it really are quite threatening. This is a, a large office building that looks more like a nuclear power station. <laughs> <laughs> and some of it, of course, uh, downright wrong. This is Fortress Wapping. This is Mr. Murdoch's, nice Mr. Murdoch's new print industry in Wapping. You probably heard of the great back. <coughs> the deal done, of course, was that Thatcher uh, would offer Murdoch this land in the new enterprise zone, and therefore all the tax goodies that go with that, in return for him breaking the print unions in Fleet Street, which he did very effectively. It's now a non-unionized plant. Now, if you stood back and said, looking at London and its strategic problems and so on, uh, if you're going to relocate an industry like the print industry, which has very heavy transportation structures, which creates great pollution, where would you put it in London? The very last place you would choose to put it would be the neck of the Isle of Dogs and the most congested bit of road infrastructure, the most difficult place to reach, surrounded by a large uh, urban population. So uh, it, it's a complete inverse of any normal plan. We now have several very large print operations uh, in this part of London. Now, the multifunctional polis never really took off, but the sort of same sort of imagery, this is Olympia New York's imagery for Canary Wharf, took off and was made into a model, was then made into reality with some of the largest and fastest construction we've ever seen, producing this in a very short time. Fast track construction, it's clip-on wallpaper architecture. It's about 10 millimeters thick. You can have any style you want, uh, neoclassical, French, Gothic, whatever you want. <laughs> you can take it off and put another bit on. It's, it's quite a problem for architects. <laughs> An extraordinarily uh, bizarre grand concept also of what the space should be like. I'll talk a little bit later about this confusion between public and private space that is coming out of all of this. All of this space is in fact private space, but the imagery of it is that it's a new public square, it's part of London, it's for Londoners, just as the Broadgate development uh, is perceived as being public. They had a lot of trouble with their wind tunnel testing and they got it wrong. Uh, it's actually a, a very uh, unpleasant microclimate and potentially ecologically a very dangerous place to be. This is the design of the pedestrian entrance into the uh, Docklands Light Railway, which I think, again, if you've got the chance to spend uh, 5,000 million pounds, you might be able to do a little bit better than that uh, as your sort of answer to the gateway to, to, to Docklands. It's a pretty mean and miserable space. Uh, this extraordinary uh, boulevard here with a circus at the end, uh, and this very grandiose square, which, as I pointed out, is uh, windswept uh, and rather unpleasant space. Uh, linked with that, major transport problems because, uh, as you probably know, transport was not uh, thought of early on. There is no planning strategy, therefore transport will only happen when the private market says we need some transport, which happens to be about 12 years down the track. Um, this is the most expensive bit of road ever built in Britain, the Limehouse Link, uh, which is now being plunged through an area of residential. Around here is council housing. The local residents are now suing the development corporation for £100 million pounds for environmental damage, uh, for the damage to their health as a result of this road construction. So a gross failure of any sort of planning process. You now have large parts of the population actually taking legal action against development corporations. Uh, we also have our own Disneyland train, <laughs> just like you do. So we're OK. We've got uh, the Docklands Light Railway, which can move about 9,000 people an hour you're looking at projected 200,000 new workers in this area, so you can work out how long it takes you to get home. <laughs> so the, the detumescence of the tower that's uh, shown in this, uh, <laughs> in this image here, if you can, uh, this is Steve Bell's cartoon about the um, failure to uh, service and, and, and uh, develop this, uh, this wonderful <coughs> injury. Um, and the offer eventually of the, the Jubilee Line extension, that's the extension of the uh, underground, not being enough to raise again the, the, the great flagship of capitalism, and, and finally uh, the, the, the complete collapse, uh, sadly obliterated by the lectern, um, <laughs> by the lamp. Can you move the lamp, thanks, um, of, um, of the tower? And that represents very much the popular imagery uh, of, of the failure of this experiment. Now, I'm running badly over time. I'll very quickly move us uh, into Spitalfields. Uh, this is the Broadgate development that we talked briefly about yesterday. Ken Walpole talked about the, uh, the skating rink in the middle <coughs> of this. This is Bishop's Gate going down to the city here, 
uh, which is the barrier of the city. On the other side of the tracks, as it were, is Spitalfields. You can see a very different density, a very different urban structure. Uh, the Broadgate itself, uh, I'll just flick through here. I put this in because I, I take issue with Ken Walpole about this question of public-private space, that I think, in fact, the Broadgate is not offering to the citizens of London uh, a valid uh, public space. It's a very alienating space. If you're not looking smart, uh, you feel bad there, and you will be approached by a security guard and asked if they can help you. Certainly the local, <laughs> <laughs> the local families that live around here, the Bengali community that make up most of Spitalfield's population, would feel extremely oppressed at entering in through this gateway uh, and uh, enjoying the pleasures of skating if that was seen to be the most important thing in their lives, which, as a planning game, I would suggest a skating rink is not the thing that the very poor people of the East End need most. Certainly the disenfranchised, like this householder here, that's his house, uh, <laughs> cannot enter uh, this public space because it is not a public space uh, and he will be refused entry. Onto the street, the ideology is very powerful, I think. The London tradition is that the buildings meet the street, often with a shop or with <coughs> some access, which is about public use of the buildings, even if they're private buildings. Here, the message is very strong. This is Cockney Capital. This is how it meets the big public street. You can't go in unless you're a banker. Now, on the other side of the street, uh, Spitalfields, uh, overhung by this uh, Broadgate development, here, uh, the large market, one of the large sites there that's uh, now vacant, uh, was uh, finally moved a year ago now, uh, and there's one of the three large sites in the area up for grabs. The area has an extraordinary history, which I won't go into. This building uh, typifies it, though. This was built as a Huguenot chapel when the Huguenots moved here in the 1750s, expelled from France. They brought with them silk weaving and cloth making, and since then the area has been the centre of the rag trade of the uh, clothing manufacturing. By the uh, 1840s, the area had become the centre of Jewish immigration from Russia, Eastern Europe, uh, and the building uh, changed from a chapel to being a synagogue. The same building today is a mosque, because the next layer of immigration, the Bengalis from Bangladesh, with the partition of Pakistan, uh, as British citizens uh, moved into here. It's the sort of part of a city that is very important. It's transitional, it's low rent, it allows all sorts of activities to happen. It's also, uh, and this is one of its problems, an area of great heritage. It has some of the finest 18th century buildings uh, in central London. And indeed, the early movement of the community development group was uh, a strange link between heritage pressure and the local community which then broke down, but it was the starting point. The threat to the low-cost uh, sweatshop type activity uh, being pushed out by the gentrification and re-commodification of 18th century buildings as luxury housing is another internal market thing going on within the area, which is very complicated. But the area maintains its tremendous viability and liveliness in the slum. This is one of the few bits of London that's still bursting with energy, full of life, lots of activity. And the rag trade operates uh, in vans on the street in a very informal way, uh, as you probably know from your own cities. One of the things that happened is that the Spitalfield Small Business Association has attempted to uh, improve the conditions of work within that informal industry without destroying the industry. So the building of small-scale new workshops at low rent for local businesses as part of an attempt to consolidate uh, their possibility to continue in opposition to the pressure from large-scale uh, developers. This is one of the other big sites, the goods yard of British Rail, uh, which closed in the late 1960s and which has been up for grabs ever since. And this is the third of the big sites, the brewery of Truman's, which closed in the 1970s. Now, all of these closures, of course, meant great loss of jobs and employment to the area. Uh, and the sites represent now tremendous potential to bring back into the area relevant uses and employment. And much of the negotiation going on at the moment is exactly about that linkage uh, between, uh, this is the market building, uh, many of the subsidiary industries dependent on the market, which are now closing, uh, specialists making paper bags, vital for the market, no longer needed. This type of activity uh, very much threatened. So it's the knock-on effect of a lot of these uh, failures of plan. 
Now the community, uh, and that manifests itself in this case um, as a consortium of about a hundred different interest groups within the area under the label of the community development group, have done many different things. As I said, they produce the plan which puts economic uh, development, training, education very much as part of physical development. They've also built, uh, or different organizations within the area through housing cooperatives, have built more than a thousand new houses within the area at a time when there was supposed to be no more social housing being built. So it's a tremendous achievement uh, with this type of new housing. Sometimes combining workshops with housing in the old 18th century tradition is being reproduced today. Sometimes very skillfully infilled into the 18th century uh, model of the streets on bomb sites. <coughs> At the same time, small, small scale recommodification of some of the buildings as office space. Now, the development group has no uh, opposition to that. The, there is, there's not a sort of uh, only, only social uses are viable attitude. Uh, the, the whole idea is for a mixed economy. Offices are fine, other things are fine, but they must be mixed and they must be integrated rather than these large blocks of single-purpose space with very little uh, accessibility to other people. So the informal economy within the area uh, still flourishing. Uh, all cities need these sorts of spaces, this type of activity, and they're exactly the sort of things that get wiped out by most of the modern concept of what planning is. I'm aware of running over time, so I can just take another two minutes to, to summarize a couple of points. Each case is very different, but they are simultaneous, and it's important always to remember that these things are happening uh, in parallel in different ways uh, in any city. Both cases show the formation of new partnerships about what planning is about, about what the remaking of cities is about. The Docklands, as we've seen, this extraordinarily large-scale, monocultural, large blocks of monofunctional space, uh, difficult to incorporate into any continuum of what the city might be. It stands alone as a, as a strange project. It's also isolated geographically, which is another problem. Um, it assumes a sort of clean sweep idea about planning, and is very explicit about that. The new partnership attempted there was one between central government through an urban development corporation, pushing aside all of the normal processes of, of democratic planning through local government, linked uh, with large-scale private capital. And Olympia New York, of course, were the biggest. Uh, as you know, they, they spent more than 4,000 million pounds in four years on that one site. Uh, and as you know, they've now gone uh, bankrupt as a result of the boom slump cycle. And, and, and largely led by this because of the locational problems of this. So that was a, a new partnership within our history of planning. Very forceful central government, very large new corporate capital. In Spitalfields, uh, a continuing mixed use, an incremental pro approach to development, a long-term strategy now being proposed from the ground by local people supported through the democratic planning organization and to some extent because of the slump, getting some hearing within the private capital market, essentially a democratic process where the new partnership is very different but it's new as well. The partnership there is uh, Government, both in the form of central government through task force, inner city money, urban program money, and so on, through local government, where their revived interest in planning and the need to pay attention to the political demands of their electorate uh, becoming uh, again on the agenda, linked with private capital, but with many different layers of private capital, with small shopkeepers, with large developers. So it's a much more complex negotiation going on. And very importantly, a third arm to the partnership, uh, which is, of course, this community initiative. So that we have a very different agenda there. And one's hope is, and we're looking at it very carefully at the moment, that this new discussion that involves, for the first time, a, a much more realistic involvement of, of local people can sustain itself and won't be like some of the community action type initiatives of the 60s and 70s, which are very much one-off oppositional movements to stop a road, to stop something from happening, and we're unable to go on to be creative and to do something. The evidence here so far is very powerful that these people are extremely skilled, they know what they're doing, uh, they are well supported by professionals, often working uh, for very uh, meager wages, uh, and there is a chance in, at the moment that this will get off the ground as an alternative model. Now you can't simply typify the two cases I've shown as being uh, 
big bang versus incremental or being anti-planning versus community planning. They're much more complicated than that, of course. There are all sorts of internal structures which uh, I haven't talked about. I think, though, that if one keeps an eye on that question of the partnerships that are being formed in both those cases and of the processes assumed in the ongoing development discussion about the city, then the very different, uh, powerful differences come out. And for my money, the future city has a much better chance of being, uh, of, riva uh, of revitalizing, of being a sustaining and continuing place that's good to live in, if we follow the second example, rather than if we desperately continue uh, to revive the first example. And I'll stop there. Thank you for being patient with me. I got on far too long. Now, secondly, one has got to say, one, for, one also can't just defend the public <coughs> sector. That's something we were arguing out yesterday. We can't just say there were these four little local governments in East London, um, and if only they'd been left to plod on for another 40 years, they would have got it right. And the sad thing is they wouldn't have got it right. Um, and also, there are a whole number of professionals like ourselves who weren't clear who we should be working with. Um, I mean, and there's, I'll be very specific because I want to bring this home. There's one institution represented here today um, which works, one part of the school works with one side in King's Cross, the developers, and another part of the school works with the community. <coughs> uh, I think that may be perfectly defensible, but it's something that needs to be argued out as what are our responsibilities if we're going to follow this out. So I, I, I think, and there's one final point, that once we are clear, about who we should be working with, and that met, and that can include both sides. And I think there are ethic, you know, ethically defensible ways of working with both sides, which you've got to argue it through. Um, <coughs> there are also issues raised yesterday in the second contribution um, by Graham Davison. There are also real intellectual issues, I and mean, the point that he was making about um, that wonderful term, epistemological confidence. And you also sense when you get a gathering of geographers, historians, planners, architects, what a terrible intellectual mess West are in, you know. I mean, to hear Colin Mercer talking, you know, the kind of the cultural studies way, and to hear a debate that I think philosophically is still dominated by positivism and has no real engagement with 25 years of intellectual work. Um, so I don't actually think we've got a lot to be proud of intellectually out where we stand, and there's one final area where I think we've got to be very clear. The final thing is, is our relationship with the public through the media. Now, my experience in London is that it's almost impossible to get raised through the, through the public media the kind of issues that Hugo was trying to raise at the end there. And I think what many of us what come from universities where we have press offices and so on, I think another area of professional responsibility must be to think how on earth do we get this issue raised of the good things that are happening in cities so that we can affect the future? 
So I just wanted to try and puncture constructively an, uh, an ethos of self-satisfaction that I felt was developing, and wrongly so, and not constructively so. Okay, thanks. Well, I don't know if I really want to respond to that, or we want to take Perhaps that. Perhaps I'd better make a very brief response. <laughs> I wasn't obviously talking about some of the good things that I think are happening in Australian cities. There are good, there are good things happening. Um, I think the whole, the whole question of professional ethics isn't often, often argued out. We've got plenty of situations in Australia, which have obviously got here, where you will have people appearing on both sides in a debate, or on more than two sides, if there are more than two sides. Um, our press debate is pretty hopeless, and tends the, the chief metropolitan papers tend to have two or three commentators in both Sydney and Melbourne who completely dominate the debate about urban issues. You also have very severe libel laws, don't yep. you? Which Usually journalists. It's actually very difficult to criticise yep. an architect or a planner in print. Yep. Uh, yep. It's, uh, I'd be, as I tried to indicate, I'd be much more <laughs> nervous about making some of the statements I made in Australia <laughs> than I would be here. So the, um, it's easy to criticise, I guess. but. But um, I mean, my presentation would be more balanced if I was looking at some, I mean, the equivalent of Spitalfields-type developments in Australia are very encouraging. But I guess in the case of the, the multifunction policy, I see sort of a collusion between all levels of government, the consultancy sector, and an extraordinary number of academics who just got on a big bandwagon, and it's going nowhere. And that picks up very much on the, the ethical question. I mean, that, mm. there was a profession actually mobilising itself to pick up the goodies, as we saw in London, from that boom, without actually exercising its other function in society, which is to say, what do we do with the skills we've got to ask where we're going and, and actually make a <coughs> debate about it? And I think that's the same in Australia and here. Yeah. That failure of, of all the professions involved to put that pressure onto the political system and onto the commissioners, either whether they be government or private capital, who are saying, uh, if you take this money, you've got to do this work. Craig. Could I just ask uh, you go, point three of clarification. You implied that these two are two models which we might choose between, but of course, um, the Canary Wharf development was situated in a very different area, wasn't it, from the Spitalfields area. It makes one wonder whether, in fact, there, there are two solutions to the same problem. Or two uh, how do you mean a very different area? I mean, the, the, in fact, within, I mean, the edge of Docklands is ten minutes walk from Spitalfields. Yes, but the diff one important difference is that uh, Spitalfields still had more than a lot of viable industry. Yes. Whereas exactly. the large, the great part of Docklands was was abandoned. Yes, I mean, there, there was a sort of self-fulfilling uh, abandonment of industry and of employment within the Docklands area, uh, although, as I pointed out, very large population still there, uh, where Spitalfields had maintained and continues to maintain a very viable but self-exploitative industrial base. So there are problems with that type of inner-city employment which need to be tackled. It's another function of planning. How can you intervene to improve uh, those sorts of areas without destroying Certainly in that sense, Docklands was a very different case where the industry had killed itself off and been killed off by external forces and all sorts of uh, pressures that led to the decline of Docklands, uh, often aided and, uh, and abetted by uh, misjudged attempts by planners and by government to do something about it. Uh, also very different uh, in, in scale, of course, when looking at the, at, at the Docklands as it's now typified within the Development Corporation area alone as 22 square kilometres. Um, the whole of Docklands is much bigger, but that area appropriated itself is 22 square kilometres, whereas Spitalfields you can walk across it in, in, in 10 minutes. So that it's another function of this problem of, of, of um, which goes a bit back to the old sort of thing of land use planning, you colour in a bit on the map, and you say this bit is coherent because I've coloured it in on a map, and so we're going to deal with this bit, and we're not going to look just a little bit outside that bit. As a wonder, uh, you, you probably don't remember on the diagram of the map, there's a sort of cutout, which looks rather peculiar. That the line goes along following the main road, and it dips down and goes back up again. Uh, and as with all land use planning, one can then plot why various bits were included or not included, uh, just as you can plot the route of an urban motorway, depending on urban protest groups and, and socioeconomic uh, forces. You can actually see that it wiggled around to avoid a particular electorate. Well, in this area, the cutout actually represents Canning Town, 
which is probably one of the most difficult and impacted of the old working class areas, uh, deeply unemployed, quite uh, a problem in social and, uh, and, and, and other terms. Uh, and the development corporate said, no thanks, and to draw the line uh, to avoid that. But that's, that's Newham's problem, um, but we'll take the bits that, that haven't got anyone on them. So when then moves into the question of who makes the decisions where the lines are drawn, as well as who makes the policies that then fill those lines. But you're certainly quite right that they're, they're not comparable in any sense, other than that they're happening simultaneously within a city and under the same overall regime, uh, so that it is possible for quite different things of, to, to buck the trend, if you like. The point I made at the beginning, that these shifts of the changing of gear within different economic and social patterns and, and different political regimes, that there are op openings for other things to come through. As professionals or, or, or uh, in my case, practitioner as well as a, a, an academic, those openings are often important places for us. It's those sort of the rough edges where bits are changing that are the most important and most instructive places for us to be involved in, uh, but often the most problematic as well. Thanks. I think in, in fairness to the later speakers, we will have to draw this session to a close. But of course, Hugo and, uh, and Peter will be happy to answer questions during coffee. We'll, we'll break now. If anyone needs uh, the toilets, the women's are on the next floor and the men's are on the ground floor and they're at the back of the building. Coffee is served at the back of this room, as will lunch be later. And we'll try and get the next session going in about 15 minutes at 25 to 12. Thank you.